My name is Keith Wyatt, and I'd like to welcome you to this video, Blues Rhythm Chops. For about the next hour or so, we're going to talk about lots of different styles and techniques of blues rhythm playing. If you've never really studied the subject, you're going to find that there's a lot of variety that you can get into a very simple style. The problem a lot of people have when they start out playing rhythm is that it seems boring because you've only got a couple of ideas, so we're going to solve that problem in a hurry. And by the time you get done with this video, I think you'll realize that there's a world of possibilities out there that you can explore and make your rhythm playing as artistic as your lead playing. First thing we're going to do is tune up. So get your guitar out, and I'll play each of my strings, and you tune up to me. Then we'll get down to business. Here's my low E. A. D. G. B. And high E. Now some of you have probably been playing for a long time and maybe some of you just started out. So let's take a few minutes to talk about the basics and make sure we're all speaking the same language here. The shuffle rhythm is the essence of the blues feel. And it's composed of three parts to the beat. Now let me explain that, all right? You get your basic beat going. Okay, you tap your foot along with that. That's the beat or the pulse. Now when you're playing a shuffle, what you're doing is dividing that beat into three parts. It might sound like this. All right. Now what makes it a shuffle is when you leave out the middle part of that triplet, and it sounds like this. And that's what we all recognize as a blues shuffle. It's a long part of the beat and a short part of the beat. And put them together and you get that shuffle feel. It's supposed to be relaxed. It has to lay back. There's always a battle between guitar players and drummers and bass players trying to get that feel to lay back. That's a big part of being in the rhythm section, is getting all the instruments to play together. Now, we can express that shuffle in so many different ways. That's really what this video is about. So uh, we're going to get down to specific patterns that you play, stylistic patterns that make that come alive in just a moment. But first, we have to know how we're going to apply that shuffle. First thing we're going to do is we're going to need some chord shapes. Say, for instance, we want to play an A. Here's my A major triad. Now I lift up the fourth finger. I've got A dominant seventh. Or I can add the fourth finger on the second string for another version of that big chord shape. The only other chord that I really need to know for the moment is it's D. The root is on the lowest string of the chord. There's D dominant seventh. There's one important variation that you use a lot, and that's this chord right here. D dominant ninth. That's played with the second finger, first finger, and the third finger on top. Now the reasons why these chords have the names they have, 7th chord, ninth chord, that gets into music theory. It's not really what we're trying to deal with here today. So just know these chords by shape and you'll be all right. And as we go along, I'll show you exactly how to use them. So we have two basic chord shapes. Now we take those two shapes and we put them together in a key to play a blues. The most common structure is called the 12 bar blues. That's a chord progression. That's 12 bars in length. And it's usually arranged one of two different ways, and I'll show you the two variations. Here's a 12-bar blues in A, okay? Starts like this, one, two, three, four. A, second bar, third bar, fourth bar. Then we go to the four chord, D, and back to A. Now we're gonna go to an E chord using that D chord shape, Back to D again. And we're ready to start the whole progression all over again. Now, a couple of things that are important to note there. 
first of all, I'm playing a rhythm which I'm going to show you in a second. Uh, when I change from one chord to the next, I'm using numbers. I say one chord, four chord, five chord. That's the easiest way to learn to play blues, because then you're not depending on knowing the names of the notes in each key. In the key of A, A is the one chord, D is right next door, that's the four chord, and E, the five chord, is on the fifth string, based on the fifth string, up two frets. All right. All the 12 bar blues that we play are going to be made up of the one chord, the four chord, and the five chord. Now at the end, I went five, four, one, and then I went like that. That's the turnaround. And I'm going to show you in each example how to play different types of turnarounds. Very important part of the progression. The only variation that you usually see in a 12 bar blues is when you go to the four chord in the second bar instead of waiting, right? And it sounds like this. One, four chord, and back to the one. And then I go back to the four chord, and the rest of the progression is just like it was in the first case. When you go to the four chord in the second bar, that's called the quick change. And before you start to play a tune with a band, you need to say, somebody needs to take charge and say it's going to be a 12 bar blues and a quick change. And then people will know what to do, so the band all plays together. All right, so you've got a shuffle, you've got two chord shapes, and you've got a 12-bar structure. The rest of it is all going to be a matter of style, how to play those chords, what part of the chord to play, and how to fit in with the band. So you need to know something about what the rest of the band is doing. And right now, our band consists of a bass player and a drummer. Now, to play good rhythm, what you're doing is you're building on a foundation. The foundation comes from the drums and the bass with the guitar laid on top. Most blues bands, you usually have one guitar playing with bass and drums or two guitars or maybe guitar and a keyboard. You need to know different textures and different ways of laying over top of that foundation, but the foundation is usually almost the, always the same. So let's take a second and look at the blues band from the bottom up. We're going to construct the drum kit and add the bass part so you know what you're working with. Okay, let's step over to the band. The basic blues shuffle pattern starts with the kick drum playing on every beat. The snare comes in on the second and fourth beat, or the back beat. The real shuffle feel comes from the hi-hat, and it can also be played on the ride cymbal with the snare also doubling up on the shuffle. Now let's add a little bit of bass. The bass here is playing a walking line. In other words, it's playing quarter notes right along with the kick, and it's outlining the chord changes. No matter what style of rhythm you play on the guitar, these are the basic ingredients that you need to work around. Now, I'm going to show you three ways to construct a rhythm part on a medium shuffle. And that involves using different parts of those chords that I mentioned earlier. Let's play in the key of A, for starters. If I play an A dominant seventh chord, I'm using a bar chord that involves all six strings. Now, if I was to play a shuffle using that chord, I might play something that sounds like this. It's got all the right ingredients. The chord is right, the rhythm is right. It doesn't sound particularly bluesy, though. It's a little corny, in fact. So the stylistic part of playing rhythm is to know how to break that big chord down into small parts, and that's going to make it fit into the band better and not sound quite as folky as that does right there. So first, I'm going to concentrate on the low end of the chord. Now, instead of playing my chord like this with all six strings, I'm really going to play three notes. That's the root, and then the fifth. It's the fifth note of the scale. And then the root again. And I'm going to bar these two notes with the third finger, which means barring and then kind of bending that finger back a little bit to get it up and out of the way. Now, here's the pattern I'm going to play, and I'll show you how to do it in just a second. Now, 
Now what that is, is it's kind of rocking back and forth there. You play that first uh, chord shape, and then on the alternate beats, you add your fourth finger up two frets. Now that's quite a stretch, depending on the kind of guitar you have and how big your hands are. You might find yourself really reaching out there. But you're going to have to do this quite a bit to play blues rhythm, so this is a good exercise for you. So I keep my hand in position, and I simply reach up with the fourth finger on the fifth string only. What I want to avoid is barring with that fourth finger. That's no good. That note doesn't fit, right? So I'm really hitting just the fifth string there. Naturally, I cover up the fourth string when I do that, but that's OK. So the pattern is. Now notice in the right hand I'm using all down strokes. I'm not going to bother with any up strokes at this point. Down strokes give me more consistency. Another important thing is that I'm accenting the down beats. That's when my foot hits the floor, right? So listen to the difference here. Two, three, four, one, and two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three. Whenever I say the number, I'm playing a little bit harder on the ands or the upbeats. I'm playing a little softer. This is important because it gives the rhythm a dynamic quality, it makes it more interesting, and it makes it easier to move to. The other important thing is in my left hand. I'm not holding my hand down all the time. If I did, it would sound like this. You hear how the notes run together? What I'm actually doing is releasing the pressure in between the hits. Now to play that with a 12 bar shuffle, we have to do the same thing on the D chord. So I move my hand over to D. Now the trick here is that since I'm not playing the sixth string, I have to mute it with the tip of my finger. You notice how the tip of my index finger is right up against that string and it prevents it from ringing. That way I don't have to worry with the pick whether I hit that string or not. It's not going to make any noise. Do the same thing here, adding the fourth finger. to A. Here comes the E. That's exactly the same as the D, it's just up two frets, same pattern. Then I go to D, and back to A. Now that, as I explained, is the turnaround. This is very important. You have to know how to play these chords in time. And what I'm playing specifically are ninth chords. And the ninth chord is formed by playing the second finger, first finger, third finger, and then moving down. Same chord, down one fret. All right. The timing of the turnaround is what counts. Listen to how I play it. I'm going to play the last four bars of the progression. E, D, A. Two, three, four, one, two, and three, four. Start the whole thing again. Now that part sounds good because it's based on all the downbeats. You can really feel the beat coming from that rhythm. Da 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 da. The next part I'm going to show you is based just on the upbeats. It's a little bit different, and this is similar to what piano players play on the blues. Now um, it sounds like this, just so you get an idea of it. One, two, three, four. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one. Now that sounds very strange by itself, but when you hear it with the band, you'll understand how it works. Now this is based on a chord shape called the ninth chord. Here's the A dominant seventh chord. You already know how to play a D9 chord and an E9 chord. The A9 chord is fingered like this. First finger, third finger, second finger, fourth finger. The root's right there. You're not playing it, but that's the root. So see it, but don't finger it. Now the trick to this one is that you're only playing on the upbeat of the shuffle. Right? Now, I'm going to play very slowly, and in my right hand, I'm going to hit the strings on the downstroke on the beat, but I'm not going to pick them. I'm going to use the side of my hand just to give myself the feeling of the downbeat, and then I'm going to stroke it on the upbeat. Play along with me on the A chord. Two, three, four, one and two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and. 
Don't sustain the chord. Let it go as soon as you play it. Get the idea? By using that downstroke, it really helps you stay on time. Okay, now let's put it together in the 12 bar shuffle. And the tricky part here is you're never going to hear the downbeat of the new chord change. You have to feel it. Play along with me one time through. One, two, three, four. One, and two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four. Third bar, fourth bar. Here comes the four chord. One, and two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four. Back to the one. The five, back to the four, and back to the one. And now the turnaround. One, two, and. And you can start the next chorus. Now that part's going to feel a little strange when you first play it because you're saying, where's the downbeat? And it's easy to get off time. But once you get comfortable and play it with the band, you'll find it's one of the most useful parts. And it's a total contrast to the other one. It fits well when you have two guitar players. One plays the first part I showed you, one plays that part, and you got a great team. Now I'm going to show you a third part. And again, this would work as a second guitar part on top of another rhythm, or if it's a guitar and a keyboard. This one's really based around the sound of a horn section. All right? It sounds like this. Check this out. Two, three, four, one. Get the idea? What I'm doing is playing versions of the A chord, and I'm using a ninth chord for the D, and I'm playing a different kind of rhythm. Rather than keeping a steady time, playing on downbeats or upbeats all the time, I'm only playing little accents. I'm thinking like a horn section, and that's really what makes the difference. So the chord that I'm using, first of all, is again based around that A7. We've got A9. This one is called A13 getting into jazz here. First finger bars across the top four strings. The second finger plays on the third string, up a fret. And then you can use your third finger or your fourth finger, it doesn't matter, to play the second string. And you get the full chord like this. Now you're only playing the top four strings. And here you have to be a little bit careful with your pick that you don't strike the bottom strings because that'll muddy it up. The four chord is D9 and the five chord is E9. We already know these chords. The only other trick is that I'm playing it by going down a fret. All right, play along with me, don't you? Get your hand on that A13 chord. Here we go. One, two, three, four, one. Three, four, one. Three, D. Three, four, one. E. D. Back to A. The turnaround's in exactly the same place. I'm just putting different accents in front of it. Now notice in my right hand, I'm keeping time, right? I'm going. The right hand is my metronome, and it's very relaxed. That's what gives the thing its feel. So keep time with your right hand, no matter what you're playing, and then let your left hand control the chords and how long they last. All right. Now, the three parts I just showed you are the three basic parts that every guitar player should know. They, they fit like a layer cake, the low part, the middle part, and the high part. Let's go ahead and put them to work with the band on a little three chorus 12 bar blues here, and you can hear what they sound like all together and play along.
So how'd that feel? It's, it's fun playing with a band. It's, it feels totally different, right? A part that doesn't make much sense by itself suddenly feels like it's, it's the most natural thing in the world. So uh, now I'm going to show you some variations. Um, there's, there's a lot of different ways you can take each of those ideas and build on it to create new ideas that take you in new directions and, and just make the whole rhythm thing a lot more exciting. Now let's take uh, the bass, for instance. Uh, we started out by playing a bass part like this. Now you know that the bass is playing the walking line. It's going up and down the chords and quarter notes. We can do the same thing and when the guitar and the bass play together it sounds real thick and strong, right? Now typical bass part sounds like this. Right? That's what bass players tend to play. It's just a natural bass part. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is play that same part along with the bass player. I'm not going to use the same fingering he does, but I'm going to adapt it to the guitar. We've got to keep the bass line on the bottom strings because those are the wound strings and so they sound the biggest and the most bassy when you play them together. All right. The technique is this. First finger playing the root, sliding up two frets and putting the third finger at the ninth fret to play that note, then the first finger on the fifth string third finger and fourth finger and then back down that pattern. In my right hand I'm using all down strokes but I'm keeping my shuffle pattern going like this. this. There's one other little technical thing which is that when I press those notes down I let my finger deliberately lay across the other strings without pressing them down. Right, so I hear one note at a time. This may take a little practice. The reason for doing this is that it frees up my right hand to keep stroking those strings and get the rhythm going. My left hand controls the notes very slowly. Now let's take that same pattern, we'll move it over to D and then up to E. You play along with me. A one, two, three. Four. Now here comes the D chord. Back to A again. Here comes E. Back to D, A. And the turnaround. Now a couple of little details there. Uh, in my right hand, I'm, I'm just keeping the feel going like a drum. Right, so I scratch the strings and I put in my accents the same way that you'd feel the drummer playing the downbeat and then the backbeat. Right, if I can get that feel into my right hand, then anything I play with my left hand is going to fit. Right? The other thing is that when we play the E and the D chord, you only have one bar on each and it's a two bar phrase. So I shorten it up by going root, third, fifth, and back. And then the turnaround fits in the same place it always does. Right? There's a lot of different variations that bass players use when they play on blues and if you want this to sound really tight you and the bass player would have to get together on a pattern. That one's pretty safe and there are a lot of times when you listen to recordings and you hear the guitar player and the bass player playing slightly different patterns but it still sounds good so the technique is the most important thing to learn now and then you can work out the details of which notes you're going to use later. All right. Now the, th the uh, next part I'm going to show you is again moving over to the middle part of the guitar. We got our bass part and the middle part. And uh, here's one here that um, is an idea that I got from a guitar player named Robert Lockwood Jr. So Robert Johnson's uh, stepson uh, by coincidence and a great blues guitar player in his own right. It goes like this. <laughs> I'm moving up to play the D instead of staying in position. And the reason is I want that same sound on every chord. To be most consistent, you use the same shape and just move up and down the neck. If you stay in the same position, it's more convenient to finger, but it has a slightly different sound. All right, let me show you how that part is played. Now, here's a, here's a tricky little number here. 
that uh, blues guitar players do quite often. That's the thumb over the top. In other words, I'm playing the root with my thumb. Now, when you learn to play guitar, if you have a good teacher, they'll teach you to keep your thumb behind the neck. That's classical style. But most people that play elective just grab it like a baseball bat. That's the way I do it. So thumb over the top, and by doing so, I'm fingering, actually, that low A. Then I form my other fingers into a triad. So now I've got a four note chord, the fifth string and the top string are muted by the other fingers that are naturally in position like that. So when I strum all the strings, I just hear the four, with the one on the bottom and the other one's in the middle. Then if I lay my third finger down, now it looks sort of like a D chord laid over that A bass, but when I go back and forth, I get a pattern. The pattern is kind of like, it's that same pattern up an octave. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Here comes the D chord. And here we go. That turnaround right there is one that's so typical and so easy to use that you can play it on any blues that you know how to play. I'll show you another kind of turnaround which is more typical of Robert Lockwood's style and that would go like this. Right? Now that's a little trickier. What it involves is a bass line and a new chord. This chord is E7. It's a very typical chord shape. Probably you already know this one. It's one that you usually learn down here as a C7 chord. All right? So again, the timing is 5 chord, 4 chord, and here we go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2. All right? I still come in on the second beat with that turnaround, but instead of playing the chord, come in with the bass line, then play the chord. Now that's a good variation to know because it's typical of Chicago style blues and, and uh, the more different styles you learn, the more you'll hear how even turnarounds vary from player to player and from region to region. So that's a good second turnaround to know. Now I'm going to show you another way to play in the middle range of the guitar here. This is also another phrase that's typical of the style of Robert Lockwood. It goes like this one. <laughs> See, again, you can see that when I go to the four chord, I'm shifting to a new position so that I can keep playing the same shape. Now, this is based around the A chord. I'm playing on the middle three strings. This time, I'm not going to worry about that bass note. I'm just going to play the fourth, third, and second strings. Now, the move that I'm about to show you here is one that you can use in infinite variety to create different rhythm patterns. So it's a good one to learn right now. Here's how it goes. Um, First of all, finger the chord, but now bar with your index finger playing the third and second string, so it's more like an A minor chord. And then you hammer on with your second finger to make it major. That little hammer on is real typical not only of rhythm, but you hear it in lead. Right? So those phrases aren't really that much different. Now. Fold your third finger over, and you get that D chord shape. All right? See, I'm creating a little rhythmic phrase from those two little finger moves there. Now I'm going to add a variation. Now that's the tricky one. This might take some practice. I shift position. First finger, third finger, second finger, and then back. Very slowly. Three, 
four, one. Again. Now if I take that same idea and move it up to the 10th fret, I can play the D chord. And back to the A. And then the E. Now again, because the E chord only lasts for one bar, I can't complete the phrase, so I'll complete it on D. It'll go like this, E. And then the second half of the phrase on D. And then I'm back to the beginning. I can play that turn around, or I can go that turn around. Two choices now, all right? So now we got three variations. Here's a fourth variation. And this one is more typical of the style of a guitar player back at the beginning of blues, known as T-Bone Walker. This is not exactly a lick that I took from T-Bone, but it's one that is in the style that he played and a lot of other people since then. It goes like this. One, two, three. It's going to be more like a melody of its own. Now this involves one new chord here. It's another version of A. We know the A chord at the fifth fret. You can play another version of A at the seventh fret. It's still A dominant seventh. First finger, third finger, second finger, fourth finger. Now I'm only interested in the top three strings, and it's easier for me to finger it using these three fingers. Second finger, first finger, third finger. So I'm going to finger it like that. And then I'm going to play this chord here, which is an A sixth chord. You notice how I'm adding notes to the basic A sound. Typical of blues, 6th chord, 13th chord, 9th chord. Those are the things that make it sound right. If you play triads, it never quite sounds right. You have to know these variations to sound like you really know what you're doing. So here's a 6th chord, root, 3rd, 6th. It's a triad, and I add my 4th finger on the 2nd string. All right. So the pattern, and then, I use the same part of the lick that I just showed you, right? So coming down with that hammer on. Now when I go to the four chord, instead of changing position as I did for the other phrases, I'm going to stay close to home here. And check this out, right? One chord, four chord. A little bit different. Now here's the trick. When I go to the four chord, I've got D. Going back to our D shape here, what I'm doing is adding a note on top, like, like we did for the A7 chord in open position. This is the D7 chord, and then playing like a D9 chord. Whenever I'm just playing a couple of notes, I'm not necessarily going to finger the whole chord. I'll just finger the notes that I need. So here I'm using my index finger. And then finishing the phrase off pretty much like I did the first time, except I don't do the little hammer on. Why? It sounds better not to against the D chord. So the D phrase right? it's half familiar with half of a new bit to it. Then back to A. Now the E chord. There's familiar E9 shape, and then I'm going to go just slide it up a half step, down, and then land on the A. And then play the turnaround. All right? It's a lot of stuff to think about all at once. Let me put it together for you and work on a little bit. Play along with me. Here we go. One, two, three.
Now, I should mention one thing. When we play a blues, of course, we do the turnaround. The last time you play the, the thing, when you're getting ready to finish up the whole song, you don't play the turnaround. Very important. That's when you sound like a fool if you go back to the five chord, right? So if I'm going to end the song, here's how I'm going to do it. Uh, five chord. Mm. At the end of the song, instead of going from the sixth chord to the five chord, I go from the flat two chord to the one chord. And typically, I'll use that ninth shape. The timing is identical to the turnaround, but you don't go to five, you go to one. That's how the song is over. If you don't go to one, it sounds like it's going to keep going, all right? So when you play with the band, which you're about to do, Play it down just the way I showed you, four times. You're going to play first the bass line, then you're going to play the basic part up an octave like that, then you're going to play the little phrase, and then you're going to play the horn part. And after the fourth time, when you get ready to end it, go back to the one chord. All right? Have a ball. talk for a second about up-tempo blues. Now this is when things are flying by and often is very confusing for guitar players because if you try to take those medium tempo patterns we talked about and just make them faster, it turns into a big jumble. You got to approach it from a different angle. Less is more. The faster the tempo, the less you play and it's going to work just as well. In fact, it'll swing harder. Now, again, I'll show you three basic ways to approach an up-tempo blues. First is to start by playing the bass line as we did before. This time we're going to vary the bass line. In fact, we're going to vary the key to make it more typical of this style. What we're about to do is, is what's commonly called jump blues, and jump blues dates all the way back to the 1940s. Guitar players like T-Bone Walker, saxophone player Louis Jordan, B.B. King got his start playing jump blues. And what it is is, is a jazz-influenced style of straight-ahead blues, 12-bar progression but with a slight twist, all right? Now, for instance, if I want to play the bass line on an up-tempo blues, I'm essentially going to play the same notes I was before and just pick it up slightly. I also have to have a little lighter touch. For example, key of B-flat. This is a good jump blues key right here. If I want to play the bass line, it sounds like this. Because I'm playing fast, I have to have a lighter touch. If I hang on to the notes, they'll get muddy. Here's the important part of the whole technique. In the right hand, 
get my right hand going with the same field the drummer's using, right? Slowing it down. Three, four. There's the back beat. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Notice how loose my right hand is. That keeps it relaxed and keeps me in the pocket. I can play at any tempo with this technique because it's very relaxed. If your hand tightens up, that's a problem. That's where you have to work on gradually loosening up and building your tempo. Now, um, at the end of the pattern, I varied it a little bit. I went, instead of playing five, four, one, I went two, up to the five, and back to the one. That's just the typical pattern for a jump blues up tempo kind of groove. So just one you learn, and then you know it. All right, so two and back on down. Bass players will do that more often than not on this kind of a pattern. So I play along with the bass <clears throat> and just use a light touch, follow those notes, and I pretty much got it made for the bass. Now, when I get to the middle section of the guitar again, all the patterns we came up with involve using quite a few notes and moving the hand around quite a bit. Because of the tempo, I'm going to simplify everything down to the absolute basics. Look at that B flat chord. It's got six notes in it, big fat shape. How many of those notes are essential to make the chord sound the way it does? Believe it or not, only two of them. It's these two right here. Right? You don't even need the root. There's the root. Don't need it. Why? Because the bass player is playing it. All right, so here's how it goes, like this. Imagine, key of B flat. One, two, three, four. There's the E flat. Back to the one. Here comes five, four, back to one. How simple can you get? Now the other thing I can do again is go up to the high part of the guitar, and I can play some kind of a little pattern that uh, again is reminiscent of a horn section. In fact, I'll use part of the pattern that we already played, right? Right, and then vary it with another pattern that we already played. Right, so get this. I could go right by putting those patterns together I create new patterns we got a lot of little building blocks now that you can recombine when I go to the four chord right go to the five chord now remember the bass doesn't go to four so I'm gonna go up just for a little variation then back to the five, and then back to the one. And then finally play my turnaround. Now to hear how all these parts fit together, you're again going to play along with the band. The band's going to be playing an up shuffle or a jump blues in B flat. We're going to do three choruses. First time I'm going to play with the bass, second time I'm going to use those little organ punches, and the third time I'm going to play horn section. So check it out. Swing time. Now when you play each one of those little parts by themselves, they're not too difficult. They're all based on things we've already learned. Uh, I'll take you a little bit further right now and show you something that combines all those parts together. Now this is kind of leaping off into the unknown here. Everything that I'm about to play, I've already showed you in one form or another, but the tricky part is doing it all at once. Check this out. Man, there's 
the whole band in there, right? I got the bass line going. I've got the chord punches. You can feel the beat, right? Now, this is something that I developed only after playing for a long time and, and realizing I had all these little bits that were kind of unconnected, and I started putting them together and, and just, you know, having fun with it. This is the kind of thing that I, I don't use a lot because it's very full. And rem remember, your job is to support the other instruments. But when you're playing in a three-piece band, especially where you're the only guitar player, sometimes you can use something real big to kind of build up the intensity behind the vocalist. All right? So everything I've showed you uh, is all in there somewhere. Um, got the bass line. Using the thumb again. Using the sixth chord, going to the ninth chord. The little half step. Another little half step move. Now I vary the bass line there a little bit. You have to go with the bass on this. So as I say, the trick is doing it all at once. The thumb is a big deal. Work on the bass line first. Work on the chord punches second. And then work on putting them all together if you feel like you want to pursue this uh, little idea here. Now let's get down and dirty to the essence of what blues is really all about. It's uh, the most expressive style of blues, and that's what I'm talking about is slow blues right here. Slow blues is where you really have a chance as a lead guitar player to stretch out and, and uh, show your personality. It's what singers love to do most of all. It's the most emotional style of blues, and in some ways it's, uh, it's the trickiest to play rhythm on because there's a lot of empty space and so you really have to take care with what you play and when you play it. As before, I'm going to show you some basic patterns that every player should know and then I'll show you some variations. All right. Now, uh, let's do it in the key of G this time, just for fun. Good slow blues key. Starting again with a G chord. If I break that chord down, I've got bass, the middle, and the high end. Starting with the bass line. Now, on a slow blues, there, there is no one single bass line that everybody uses all the time. There's lots of variations. This is where different songs have different identities based on the differences in, in the bass lines themselves. So we're going to pick one and just use it as a, as a foundation for this little tune here. Uh, here's a typical one. You notice it's not a walking line, it's not every quarter note, or breaking the beat up a little bit because of the tempo. Now, bass players do play walking lines on slow blues, but usually as a variation during a solo or something just to give it a different texture. So it's quite common to have an identifiable pattern like that that's played on every chord. So option number one, double the bass line. All right, that's a good one. Option number two, play a chord lick in the middle section of the guitar like this. Now the pattern that I'm just playing here is probably the single most common slow blues guitar chord pattern that there is. And what it involves is two chords that we've already learned strung together. You know the sixth chord, and you know the ninth chord. I'm only going to use the fourth, third, and second strings on this one, so I use these three fingers and slide them down two frets. And when I go to C, I've got two options. One, I could play in the same position with a one finger move like that, or I can move up to the eighth fret and play the same shape I played on G. I like that because the, the tone is more consistent. Also, I can kind of add vibrato on it, which is nice when you're playing slow. Now, variation number three is to fill in all the gaps. When you're playing a slow blues, you can really hear the triplets because of the tempo. It's that, 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 that. So one thing I can do on the guitar 
is to play all the parts of the triplet rather than just the shuffle. Sometimes on a slow blues, you'll hear a, a part like that, but quite often you'll also hear something like this, three, four. What I'm doing is keeping constant time. This is what the right hand of a piano usually does on a slow blues, is that triplet feel. It fills it out and provides a nice foundation for anything that's happening on top. Chords I'm using, again, I'm, I'm kind of going uptown here. 13th chord, you already know that. Four chord, ninth chord. I could also use a G9, right? Use my little half step moves. as long as I hit the new chord on the downbeat. Now check this out. Three, four, one, two, three. That's a pretty stock move there. It's kind of a cliche in some cases, but it definitely works. I'm going from the one chord to the four chord. The timing is this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. And there I am on my C9 chord. So that little move starting exactly in that spot in the rhythm gets you from the one chord up to the four chord, moving in half steps. It really works. You hear every blues band do that at some point during the evening. Um, what else is there to say? Five chord, D9, C9, and then I play my turn around and end it. Half step move. All right, let's go play with the band. We've spent all of our time in this video talking about a certain type of blues, that's blues based on dominant chords. 
as a very uh, common other style of blues, which is called minor blues. And uh, minor blues can be played slow, medium, or fast, uh, played with 12 bar chord progressions or other variations. But the one thing that really sets it apart is that the chords are minor instead of dominant. So for instance, typical blues in A, we've been playing A7. In a minor blues, it would be A minor or A minor 7. The four chord, instead of being D7, is D minor or D minor 7. And the five chord is E minor or E minor 7. Certain players play a lot of minor blues. Uh, Albert King had a big hit with a record called I Will Play the Blues for You. That was a minor blues. B.B. King had a big hit, one of the biggest blues hits of all time, with The Thrill Is Gone. That was a minor blues. Otis Rush from Chicago made his career off of several classic minor blues. So it's a style that's been used a lot to help cross over from traditional blues into more current styles of funk or uh, even Latin music. Now I'll show you one way to play a minor blues. Uh, it's quite common in minor blues not to use a shuffle. Instead, using something a little bit more on the funky side, maybe a little bit more modern sounding by blues standards, that is. Uh, so, for instance, something like this. Now, what I'm doing there is basing all of my rhythm patterns off of a single shape for A, that's A minor, and I'm using a little trick, which I've showed you already, thumb over the top. And with the thumb over the top, that frees up other fingers to play embellishments or extra melodies. basing the rhythm pattern around a, a, an eighth note, that, 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 more of a straight groove rather than a shuffle, that, 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 that. Very important difference, and it takes us into a different stylistic area. As far as the other notes I'm adding, it's all with the first and third finger, and they're all just based around, really, the minor pentatonic scale in fifth position there. Um, all those little trills and embellishments are things that you hear in guitar players like Jimi Hendrix, who studied players that played minor blues and learned some of his tricks from these guys. So uh, that would be on the A chord when I go to the D minor 7 chord. Because it's a minor 7th, that leaves one finger free, the fourth finger, so I can play. And I can add notes or I can take away notes to create a little pattern. minor, D minor, A. I think after this video you you probably uh, started to get the picture that uh, there's a lot out there to learn and you can spend the rest of your life perfecting a blues rhythm style, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a deep subject and well worth your time and effort. If you want to be a good lead player, you have no choice but to become a good rhythm player. All right, we're going to take it on out of here now and go back to the band. So uh, I hope you had fun with it and I'll see you the next time.